Hey friends, thanks for joining me, Jim Baroud, to hear a few insights from leaders who represent our innovation ecosystem. Today's chat is with Jonathan Finkelstein, the founder and CEO of Credly, and a nationally recognized innovator in the education and workforce development space. And Michelle Van Noy, the director of the Education and Employment Research Center at Rutgers University and the author of the new book, Credentials. I'm Michelle Vinoy, uh, Director of the Education and Employment Research Center um, at Rutgers University School of Management and Labor Relations. Um, our center uh, studies all things related to education and work. Um, you know, we've, but we've uh, done a fair amount of work recently on credentialing and non-degree credentials, uh, among other things. Thanks, Michelle. Jonathan? Uh, nice to see you both. I'm Jonathan Finkelstein. I'm the CEO of Credly, uh, which is now a part of Pearson. Uh, and my work over the years has very much focused on uh, employability and what can people do with their skills that advances um, them towards their full potential. And that's very much um, about uh, how we think about credentials. Great, great. Well, um, now you both have really impressive backgrounds. Let's, let's talk about uh, each of those. So Michelle, again, you go first. Tell us you know, about your educational career journey. Yeah, sure. Happy to. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I started off my career, you know, broadly interested in education and doing research in education. And I quickly became interested in the kind of education to work transition. So this was back in the day when we were worried, we were thinking about school to work policy and, and trying to figure out um, how to better do that. And so I got involved in research related to, to, to those questions. Um, as part of that, you know, I became interested, I was involved in some research on industry certifications in the context of community colleges. So that was in the early 2000s when there was a big proliferation of, of um, those credentials. And um, so that sort of piqued my interest in following that. Um, I ended up um, going to work at the Community College Research Center um, at Teachers College Columbia and um, also while pursuing my doctorate. And um, you know, really focused on issues related to community colleges and workforce issues um, uh, related to that transition process. And, um, you know, again, I think the, the this is where the thread for credentials kind of um, became important for me because, you know, part of that is credentials are, I saw as being very important for that transition for people to be successful in the transition from education to work. Um, and so, you know, that became the focus of my dissertation um, where I, um, did interviews with employers and um, who are looking to hire IT workers to look at um, how they valued credentials in that hiring process. So I spent weeks doing interviews in Detroit and Seattle. So anyway, that's sort of um, that was sort of my academic journey. And then following on that, I, I came to Rutgers and you know can, kind of continued in that sim similar line of of research. Um, you know, again, focusing on community colleges, but higher ed more broadly, and all these questions related to education and work, but really uh, continuing with this um, this thread and this interest in understanding, um, you know, how credentials are used and, and what they mean, you know, what they mean to various actors that, that care to, to use them. And um, recently had the opportunity to uh, co-author a book on credentials, which we can chat more about later, so. Great, great. Well, thanks, Michelle. Jonathan, I know you had a, a, a more of a business sort of uh, tact, Talk to us about that. Uh, sure, my my uh, my story in a nutshell, Jim. Uh, I'm a son of two New York City public school teachers, so I got a very early appreciation for both being a learner and what it's like to help develop learners. Watching my parents come home and prepare for their students each each night, uh, and then remind me about how to be the best one I could be. Um, had a privilege to get a, 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 a liberal arts education that afforded a lot of uh, good new ways of thinking. Um, was pre-med while I was there, but realized right before the uh, applications went in that I was actually not ready to apply to medical school. And thankfully I had not majored uh, in pre-med, those were my electives. I was uh, actually a visual arts uh, uh, major uh, and, uh, but didn't quite know what direction to go and wound up um, having uh, an early job during the first dot-com boom uh, in which I really got interested. And despite my parents thinking that I was off to medicine, I wound up going into their world of education and uh, actually helped start one of the first companies doing what we're doing today, real-time conversations on the web at a time when hearing a real-time voice come out of your computer felt like an Alexander Graham Bell moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
uh, that uh, product went on to be acquired by, um, by Blackboard. Um, and I went on to uh, start a business helping organizations that are focused on workforce development, creating new generations of experts, connect with people in their field in all different ways. We worked with the Smithsonian to help curators and scientists connect with learners around the world. We worked with Intuit to help parents teach their children about financial literacy. We were working with big brands that wanted to have a, a, an at scale impact around learning in some real world way. And it was through that work that we really uh, came to appreciate that there was a lot of innovation in how people were connecting to expertise and finding learning and even new ways of doing assessments in a, in a highly digital world, but there was virtually no innovation in how people got credit for it and how they were acknowledged for their new skills. Uh, and that's where we decided to focus and that became the impetus for founding Credly. How do you uh, create a more consistent, a more dynamic, a more user controlled and owned way of carrying the evidence of your achievements into each new part of your life without having to reintroduce yourself or start from scratch every time. And that led to Credly. Which is credibly no, no. This is a what a really great story of a serial entrepreneur in the edtech space, right? So obviously you've seen a lot, and so that's that brings me to my next, you know, sort of topic. I really want to hear your perspectives about how the pandemic, you know, has affected the education sector, and that could be K twelve and, and higher ed. So in general, what you're seeing uh, from both of your vantage points. So Michelle, do you want to take a first stab at sort of how you view uh, the effects of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, we are certainly, I think even I, would, I should say before the pandemic, I should say, I think we were at a transformational moment on the cusp of things. And I think, you know, as many commentators have pointed out that the, the pandemic in a, in a lot of ways sort of accelerated things that were already underway, but I think really highlighted some of the needs and some of the challenges as well of, you know, where the credentialing world is, is gone. Um, you know, I think we've um, seen a lot of interest these days in, um, you know, people getting shorter term credentials um, that can help lead to work more quickly. Um, you know, and whereas that was, I think, an interest before, I think the pandemic really heightened that need um, for people to get training and those are thinking about all the shifts that were happening in the economy. And, um, you know, so I think that's, a, that's certainly a trend that's there. And, you know, I think with that increased emphasis on the short-term training and, and credentialing and alternative modes of credentialing aside from the traditional BA, you know, I think our challenge is that we have a very complicated credentialing market. So trying to make sense of that has also become much more of an urgent need and, and trend that we need to figure out. As, as Michelle said, I think we, we've certainly seen the acceleration uh, of trends that pre-existed the pandemic. Uh, a few of them of note that not only touch education, but touch workforce and, and, and how those two line up with each other. Um, I, you know, I, I think that the, the, the displacement of so many uh, members of the labor market early on in the pandemic when the world virtually shut down really forced people into new ways of thinking about connecting and learning. And, um, and for those for whom job security uh, was a very real concern or lived reality, there was a great number of people who turned to new forms of learning online during that period. Um, we saw uh, with many of the customers on Credly's network um, spikes in the earning of those very credentials that Michelle was just talking about um, as people hunkered down and thought about what kinds of skills they needed and took advantage either out of luxury of not having the commute or the time or out of necessity being out of work or 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 being or fearful uh, of their 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 current place uh, at, at, in employment. So you certainly saw that, that accelerating trend. Um, we also saw, um, uh, as Michelle alluded to as well, a, a real interest in, in role-based certifications. How do you prove that you're the best person for a role? How do you prove that you're future-proof in a world where all sorts of future trends were accelerating at the same time? Did you need to prove that you had certain skills and certain technologies and uh, and how do you have the evidence of soft skills, which are become especially important in a world where you have to sometimes overcompensate on the humanity side because you're working for many people at a distance and without being shoulder to shoulder. Uh, and so there was a, a significant interest in people who either had skills looking to prove it uh, in, in a world that needed more proof points to figure out where people fit in, in companies and organizations that had changed very rapidly. Um, but also, I think from the employer side, what we saw was 
a uh, and this pairs not only with the pandemic, but with the renewed focus on social and racial justice, which uh, really uh, came into the limelight during the same uh, the same period. And all of those factors, I think, really forced, at least among very progressive uh, employers, uh, a, a rethinking about what the employee experience was. How did that company's values reflect um, the kind of place that people wanted to work at? Um, and uh, also, how do you retain uh, employees in a world which suddenly became highly disruptive? It, it moved very quickly, as you, we all recall, from a, um, uh, from a dispersion of employees to, oh my goodness, how do I keep them? Uh, and one of the, I think the two top reasons people are choosing companies to work at today are they're choosing a great place to learn, not just a great place to work. And so learning benefits and how employers connect with the higher education ecosystem, how, how, uh, how you can prove the skills you develop on the job became one real core uh, call to action for employers to consider. And the second is values. People want to work at a company whose values they respect. They want to be able to go home to their friends and family and uh, and feel feel like their company represents their identity. And so shared values became very important as well during this period. And we see that reflected in our work through the types of things and the patterns of credentialing that emerged during this period. Right. And you mentioned something, and I want to come back to it later, about soft skills communication skills, all really important in this remote or work from anywhere sort of reality that we're in. And I'm really curious about the credentialing um, uh, that sort of is being going to be applied or being applied for that skill set, which is going to be even more important uh, going forward. But before we do that, let's, uh, you know, for, for folks who don't know what credentials are, um, I want to talk, I want Michelle to explain since she just wrote a book, which is sort of an encyclopedia of, of credentials. So uh, Michelle, if you could take us through sort of uh, the past, uh, you know, of credentialing the present and, and where maybe we're going, I'd love to get your perspective as someone who's just wrote, wrote a book on that. And then I want to ask Jonathan how he sees it from his vantage point. Sure, that's a, that's a great question because um... As I said before, the, the credentialing market is very complicated. There's a lot going on and um, a lot of confusion, I think, sometimes about what we're talking about. And so, um, you know, even among folks who spend their days only studying credentials experts, I think, you know, are still trying to refine some of the, the definitions. But through our book, we did try and, you know, synthesize some of what's what's out there. And I think when we talk about credentials um, in, 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 I think, more broadly and, and within the context of our book, we... Um, we um, think about traditional degrees um, that are offered through higher ed. So that, you know, goes from, you know, the PhD to the master's to the bachelor's to the associate degree. Um, so all these sort of traditional degrees are, you know, certainly forms of credentials that we all um, think about and, and, you know, know about to some extent. Some of them are more familiar um, than others. Um, you know, within each of those types, there's a great deal of variation. And I think that's a trend over time as there's been proliferation of different um, kinds of uh, degrees. So, you know, there's been a lot of innovation in terms of bachelor's degrees that are, you know, offered, uh, you know, on up to, you know, all, including all degrees. So I think that's, that's certainly um, one area that we get into. But I think, you know, as we think about the evolution of the credentialing market, um, there's a lot of new kinds of credentials. And not all of them are brand new, but ones that are receiving a lot of attention and interest um, lately. Um, and, you know, broadly speaking, we talk about those as um, non-degree credentials is one, one term. And there's some discussion of what's the right sort of banner term. But when I, let's just use that for now. And I think that's, um, that includes um, certificates, and those can be offered for credit uh, through higher ed institutions or other kinds of institutions or non-credit. So the credit means that it, you know, it's it's part of an accredited program. It could fold up into a degree um, easily. Um, non-credit programs can do that, but not quite as easily. So those are two, there are certificates. And those are for, for, for completing a program, an educational program that you, you know, it's a sort of a more structured program. We also have other credentials like industry certifications that um, are typically test-based assessments of someone's knowledge. Someone might prepare for an industry certification through a classroom-based experience, but they may also learn something on the job or through their own self-study to sit for an industry certification. 
We also have occupational licensure, which you know is similar. It's typically test-based. Sometimes it has a requirement for an educational program along with it, um, and so those are you know often you know state by state in different fields you know that are regulated um, by the government. Um, we also have apprenticeships, which is you know a very long-standing form of of, of um, credentialing within certain fields. You know certainly the trades have done that for a long time, but apprenticeship is something that has gained um, a lot of interest and traction um, in in recent years in terms of expanding it to other um, fields of study um, with the knowledge that, you know, apprenticeships typically have some kind of structured learning experience, but then there's also a lot of, there's the hands-on workplace learning that um, can be very valuable. So that's another form of credentialing. So um, when we talk about credentialing in the context of um, the book, those are the forms that we're talking about. And I should acknowledge, I have a wonderful co-author on this book, um, Paul Gaston um, from Kent State, um, and who's been a longtime consultant with Lumina. And we we worked very closely together on this book, um, informing a lot of these ideas. So he's not here today, but I have to acknowledge his um, wonderful partnership in, in writing that book together. Um, but we, you know, we tried to map out all of those. So hopefully that gives us some sense of the landscape and what we're talking about um, with credentials. But I do think that, you know, I think the trend that Credly is really onto is all of those new forms of credentialing, the sort of non-degree credentials, all the alternative forms. The one other I didn't mention, I'm we're missing this is also badges and micro credentials, right? So there's a whole, you know, obviously that's the whole other area that is, I think, probably the most interesting and, and you know, still being defined area. What exactly does a badge measure? But I think that um, that is where a lot of the opportunity lies in terms of um, understanding um, what credentials are and what they can mean and, and how they can mark skills that aren't traditionally marked. I think that's one of the things that's really intriguing about what Jonathan pointed out about the, the opportunity that Credly really seeks to, to um, address is, you know, what do you do with all that learning that's not formally credentialed and how do you recognize that? Great. Thank you. That was, that was really informative. Uh, Jonathan, why don't you pick it up from there and, and how you see uh, the credentials and, and particularly going into the future? Sure. So that was, that was uh, a, a terrific uh, landscape uh, view from from Michelle, I think you know from where we sit and the way I I look at the world every day, um, all of those that whole landscape that Michelle just so beautifully painted for us uh, at every stage of career and career transition and life. Um, people, as we sit here, as the three of us are gathered virtually to to have this conversation, millions of people are learning things around the world, and they're learning them in all of those different kinds of venues and formats and contexts. Um, and historically, only a sliver of those skills that were being developed ever got any form of formal recognition, uh, the most obvious and known to, uh, to most people and, 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 and to our audience today are obviously degrees and certificates coming from higher ed institutions. Um, but as Mel Michelle points out, industry certifications have been around for quite some time. Uh, IT and technology has been a leader in that, largely because of the fast changing nature of skills within that trade and the fact that any kind of acknowledgement of skills could very quickly get out of date. So there was a necessity uh, from product manufacturers and software development uh, arenas to be able to know, could you trust somebody to go do something related to technology? But, but obviously tech has not been the the only uh, center of, of industry credentials. But in any event, you take that full um, spigot, if you will, of of, of uh, credit worthiness or recognition worthiness activity. Uh, and you recognize that in real time, you have such a large number of people developing skills. Um, how do you record them? Uh, whether it is the degree or the skills that are as assumed within them, right down to on the job applied skills that uh, are recognized by your company every day while you're in the workplace. And then you bring it together to tell a complete story about what it is that somebody, not only what they have done, but more importantly, what can they do? How do you take a capabilities perspective on this? Because at the end of the day, that is really where the great value of recognition comes from. There's a momentary excitement and acknowledgement and sense of pride among somebody who earns a credential, but everyone's mind quickly turns from walking across that stage and tossing their cap, uh, even figuratively to, well, what do I get to do next? Who's going to value it? Um, and so for us, the, the real focus has been, how do you first, and, and I make it sound so easy now, 10 years in, but how do you get all of those groups that are in a position to assess skills to do it in a common way? So there's a common language, a common format, uh, shared standards for doing it so that you can tell that story in a way that makes sense, not just for each person, but for the labor market as a whole and for every player in it. 
Now you fast forward 10 years, a lot of work has happened to get us to that point where we have common standards and, and language uh, for describing achievements from a diverse range of places. Now we get to turn to the fun part, which is how do you take that critical mass and connect it up with the demand for that talent, whether it's a promotion at your current workplace, whether it's a higher ed institution that wants to value your prior learning for credit and give you a shorter, cheaper path towards the degree um, that uh, you're much closer to having earned than you might realize, or maybe it's a career change or pivot and connecting you with a hiring manager or recruiter uh, who might recognize the skills you have and, and, and maybe proactively find you uh, where you might not have even thought about considering that career or that job. All of these things reduce not only inefficiencies in the labor market, but I think they, the great promise is actually um, in reducing or removing the kind of systemic bias, which has held large portions uh, of the talent landscape back uh, simply because they haven't had the tools to be empowered to speak about their skills, or they've just been summarily overlooked at the top of the funnel when people are thinking about talent needs. And so I think credentials in their new form can be uh, a great equalizer in, uh, in connecting people, regardless of what they look like and how old they are and, uh, and where they worked or where they learned. Um, and instead focus on the skills they have. So that's the part that um, I think when I think about the future, it's that greater efficiency and much more fairness. Right, right. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, let me go back to what I mentioned earlier as far as working from remote, right? These communications, soft skills, 21st century skills, depending on the, the era, what we call them. But right now, I think they're essential skills, right? So are there any credentials that you either of you are seeing that are being created to sort of codify or at least um, certify or at least give credit to, to, to people who can work remotely more effectively than others per se, or does that, is or collaboration credential. I don't know what it is, but I'm just asking, uh, is there any movement there that, that we should be uh, aware of? Um, I mean, that's an interesting question about, um, something that would speak specifically to kind of the remote working environment. I mean, interesting. I mean, I guess there, it would be interesting to actually kind of take a look at soft skills as we think about them more broadly and then sort of map, like which are the ones that are most essential to being, to being most effective in that kind of work environment. That's a really interesting question because I bet there are, if we spend some time thinking about that, I bet, and probably someone has done that. I don't, I'm not aware, but I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I, I do think in general, the, the question of, of effectively measuring soft skills has been a, a tough nut to crack and lots of, lots of different players have tried to, to do that. And I think there are a lot of different efforts that are out there to, to do that well, but it's, it's sort of an ongoing question, I think, and um, an interesting one to think about how that can be done and have that have that mark be something that credential be something that is understood and recognized and valued by employers in the, in the hiring process to kind of create it as a currency um, uh, is I, I think still under development. But I do think there are several efforts right now that are interesting and underway on that on that front. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I just uh, ran a search on our platform on remote work to just to use. I hadn't hadn't hmm. actually looked at that particular angle uh, before to. And I came across uh, uh, literally more than a hundred distinct learning pathways that a range of providers are using to certify uh, remote work skills and competencies. So that is a thing and people are doing it apparently. Real-time update news, it's there, it's happening. Yeah. But soft skills in general are, uh, not only are we seeing, I think, a growth in the number of groups trying to recognize soft skills, but they're also becoming more contextual. I think, you know, if I were to say to you, uh, are you a good communicator? Uh, you, you might say yes, or you might say, well, it depends. I'm, I'm great in smaller settings, but I'm not so good when I have to walk on stage, or I really rock when I'm leading a board meeting, but I'm, I'm not as good at one-on-ones. I, I get awkward or whatever it is. So I think skills, soft skills are highly contextual, not just in the kinds of examples I gave, but across industries and, uh, and um, uh, across functions. And what we're seeing is even among hard skills, um, product certifications or certifications for allied health uh, or manufacturing and construction, you're seeing soft skills embedded in as competencies within, um, within certifications. So um, uh, you know, good examples are 
you know, take a, a skill like, you know, a DocuSign uh, or Tableau, these are tech products where you can earn certifications. You'll see in those skills, not just like, do you know how to use these products, but you'll see things like strategic thinking and do you have the ability to communicate with data, not just use the platform? And so that, I think that blending of those two and the ability to, when you were, when you were focused on like a certificate that had one line on it, and it was basically like completed this course, it's really hard to know what kind of soft skills may have been embedded in that because uh, soft skills do not live in isolation. But once you have a dynamic digital version of a credential, you can see the specific competencies that, that made it up. And part of that common language that I was talking about earlier is, is, um, is having all of the providers of certifications and credentials um, uh, apply uh, uh, a you know pull from a normalized set of, of jobs to be done and skills and competencies so you can kind of see those those connections. So I, I think we're seeing a lot of that. Um, I also just saw this week that uh, ACT released their ACT uh, Work Keys National Career Readiness Certificate uh, as a digital credential. And there's all sorts of workforce readiness skills and, and, and soft skills that are part of those, those assessments. But let's just double click on that for a second. You just did a search on your platform on the people or the organizations that are offering something for soft skills. So my question is, is that it, are the people who are offering the organizations that are offering those soft skills or those certificates or badges in general, isn't that, has the mix changed, right? Formerly it was nonprofit institutions, typically higher ed um, or associations, right? Um, linked to higher ed or linked to industry. What, what Has that changed? Has that sort of composition changed of those uh, new or those types of organizations or, or companies offering certificates? From, from uh, our vantage point, yes, absolutely. I think, you know, this is one of the exciting parts of this movement. And and, and, and you can tell from Michelle's earlier comments about the involvement of so many different segments of both the learning and the HR and the talent ecosystem, that once you give people a very simple common tool, um, you can start to embrace the learning uh, in a more cohesive way and see that ecosystem a lot better. Um, when it was relegated to each individual college and their registrar's office, and maybe some generalized census and statistics, um, you're, you're not getting that fuller view across the landscape. Um, but yes, absolutely. I think one of the things that we've seen just over the last year and a half or so is uh, like a 400% increase in the number of employers that are credentialing their employees. Uh, they are recognizing that we are essentially the new college. We're the new university. Um, people want to know not just what did you learn, but what can you do? And who better to tell you what someone can do than your employer, because they see you doing things every day. And that couples with what we talked about earlier, that employees want to be at a place where they can learn. And what is the common, what brings those two things together? It's a credential. It's the evidence of the learning. And it's some sort of set of standards by which you're assessed. So certainly employers are becoming uh, much more active in this ecosystem. The good news for colleges and universities, by the way, is this creates a lot of opportunity for, um, for connecting points to create more authentic learning experiences, connections between those apprenticeships that Michelle mentioned earlier and work and uh, the ability to be that kind of figure eight and move between work and learning much more readily because the, the tools that prove your, your learning and where you're at um, are, are, are shared across those environments. Right. And from your vantage point, Michelle, are you seeing that as well? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what's very interesting is that we have um, a real growth in the sort of, I guess, the infrastructure around all of this to do this kind of work effectively. Um, you know, the work that Credly and others have done around kind of creating a common language and a common way of talking about credentials and sharing information. So I, I think that um, the field has moved in leaps and bounds in that sense, in terms of having having like the baseline of what's needed to, to make the system work better. You know, I think where, where things get complicated is, um, is making sense of it all. So there's a common language, but there's just a lot. And so I think about um, you know, how are employers making sense of all of this? And I think that's what's interesting too, is I, I mean, I am, you know, there, I think there certainly are some developments that are, that I find very, really interesting in the tech space that are trying to, you know, better connect platforms like, you know, like like Credly to, to to hiring platforms and and you know sharing skills and kind of facilitating that those connections in in a sense that help to 
um, make the credentials, um, you know, have value in terms of being used and have and and having meaning among employers in the hiring process or among you know higher ed say you know for for awarding credits. So um, I think that's really where the challenge and the opportunity and where some of the really interesting developments are occurring. And that I guess I would call sort of that process of creating value for a credential. Got it. Okay, so Jonathan, let's get into Credly. Um, this is really a, a wonderful success story, uh, and it's it's unique in its own way. So, so talk to us about that sort of story from the beginning until now. As one of my former board members used to say, uh, yes, Credly is a uh, at the time he said a seven year overnight success. Um, um, but, but you know, I think it's returning to some of the the earlier personal origin stories. Um, you know, for, for me, I, I, um, I've always kind of felt that talent is, uh, is, is all around you. And we have a society and a work environment that, um, takes shortcuts to get people into roles and, um, and, and that people are often just summarily dismissed because they don't have the right tag or they didn't work at a company or go to a school that somebody had heard of before, or maybe didn't even go to or complete that education. And yet it's hard to believe that even if they had some college, for example, and no degree that they don't have any skills to show for it, that just felt like um, talent was, uh, was, uh, was prevalent, but not widely uh, appreciated and, 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 and discovered. And, and so the story behind Credly and, you know, our vision for the company has always been, how do you help people achieve their full potential on the basis of what they know and can do? That was the story from the start. And we decided to take a different approach. That's a mission or vision statement that you could imagine many companies sharing. Who doesn't want people to achieve their full potential? And there are many, many organizations, nonprofits, companies, universities, and others alike who share that goal. Um, our unique take on it was, well, what's holding people back from that realization of their potential? It's it's the the way the system works is it uh, it empowers people to kind of self-describe what they know and can do. And those with the labels that stand out wind up uh, with the advantage. And those with who otherwise have the right skills don't. Um, and sometimes those labels are unintentional. They might relate to uh, you know, unintended uh, bias that people hold when they make decisions. So we said, let's, let's actually focus on helping organizations make better human capital decisions. Um, uh, on the basis of what people actually know and can do. So if we're going to do that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of take an organization central approach to, to, to the systemic change we want. We got to go first, figure out how are we going to get all the resume worthy skills and achievements uh, into the hands of individuals. Um, and so that's what we did. And we worked very actively with open standards communities, uh, our initial uh, uh, funding sources beyond good old fashioned customers in the early days. When we took on outside funding to accelerate our growth, we turned to groups like the Lumina Foundation and Strata uh, and City and Guilds of London, um, as well as uh, venture capital investors that were deeply focused on systemic change in the way education and workforce related to each other and took a kind of ecosystem approach and uh, really worked through thought leadership and, uh, and through partnerships and ecosystem uh, efforts to try to bring everyone together to say, let's have a common way of describing skills and achievements. And now we're seeing the benefit of all of that work within this movement and within the community. I'm proud that Credly has played a central role in that, but we are not alone in, in the, by any means in terms of the, the change that has been important to take place. But now you can actually get to the part that Michelle was talking about, about that value creation for those individuals. If you log into Upwork today, um, you will see the ability to import your credentials uh, from Credly into your profile. And tens of thousands of people within days of that going live are now much more visible to people looking for their talent in a, in, with very sharp, clear signals. Uh, if you log into ZipRecruiter today, you'll see the same thing, the ability to actually now import your verified skills into your profile so uh, that those looking for your skills will find you more readily. And indeed, people with those um, uh, with those credentials are, are matching more quickly and, and, and making better fits for those who are looking for them. And we ourselves have created a talent match uh, product um, to help those looking for talent to surface them uh, in a way that's not happening today. Like, uh, you know, uh, um, online professional 
uh, sites where we share our resumes or our profiles tend to be self-reported. There's usually a lot of noise because there's a lot of things going on on those platforms. People are trying to sell you things. Uh, people are, uh, uh, are trying to figure out who's active and who's a passive job seeker. This removes all the noise and makes it entirely around skills. So we're actually taking job descriptions, pulling the skills out of them from those who are looking to hire, and then immediately connecting them with qualified, interested, and ready people for those jobs. So this is part of where we're at in the current part of the story and doing the same thing with current employers so that they've got a front row seat when somebody on their team and their company has developed a new skill. How did they get the front row seat in terms of putting them and their skills to use back to that vision and help them achieve their full potential? Um, so it's all starting to come together. Right. So do you see yourselves as a, a collaborator or competitor to LinkedIn? For example. I see yeah, I mean, I see, ultimately see the whole world as collaborators. I, I, I don't see the world in terms of competitors. The way we think about what we're doing is, you know, we are organizing all of the world's um, uh, outcomes. You know, I used to get in the early days, wait, so you guys are just the badge that goes like at the end of some course. It's like, yeah, we're just the single most important part of that learning experience. The thing you actually have to show for it at the end so you can go do something with it. Um, so we're organizing all of that without bias uh, and, and uh, without owning our own content or our own assessments or our own. We are being Switzerland and bringing all of that together in a common way um, and also bringing all that together for the individual. So their full story is represented in a trusted way. So um, I, that is why I think you see, you know, uh, traditional competitors in the market uh, all using the platform and we have Microsoft and Amazon, we have, uh, uh, um, you know, Procter and Gamble and Colgate Palmolive. Uh, we have, uh, 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 you know, Cisco, and I'm trying to think of all, all the competitors, but Coke and Pepsi are both on the platform. So I, I think that ability to, to be a trusted neutral party that brings the outcomes together. I think that's, um, you know, I think that, that, that's part of how we've been able to play the role that we have. And what are your biggest challenges then going forward? I think, you know, challenges for us are, it's a good question. I think in the, the first decade, and we're approaching our 10 year anniversary this fall, uh, was very much doing the hard work of, of trying to provide the right amount of value for all of these learning providers, assessment providers to, to adopt a common approach to recognition. I think that, ship has sailed and it isn't a question now as to whether groups should do it for those who are not yet doing it it's just a question of of when uh, the biggest challenge now is doing the same thing on the talent acquisition and the consumption side of the market how do we change the old systemic habits about recycling old job descriptions uh, about um, how we use applicant tracking systems to summarily kind of get to three or four candidates we can interview when the other, you know, 500 you dismissed are the ones who actually have the soft skills, who have the skills you're looking for, but you just took shortcuts to get there. It's how do we change the habits and how talent is deployed and found? And it's a similar story. It's, it's just, it's, it's simply that it's changing habits. Maybe a job description isn't the best way to do it. Uh, best way to find talent. Uh, maybe you're not looking for quantity in applicants. You should be looking for quality interest and readiness. And maybe you will find a different set of candidates. Maybe you shouldn't be looking at the pictures of the people while you're subconsciously deciding who gets the interview. All of these things I think are, you know, challenges, but I think the world is ready to address them. Right. Uh, that, that's so interesting, um, Jonathan. So let's talk about the future, right? The trends that, are, that we see from both of your perspectives. Let's start with a takeaway. Uh, just one, one of the biggest trends each of you see in the credentialing world. So Michelle, why don't we start with you? Go ahead. Biggest trends. Well, I, I do think that a big trend um, is certainly, I think, as Jonathan said, focusing on how credentials are consumed and ensuring that they have value. As part of that, I think, um, questions of quality and how do we measure and mark quality among credentials is a, is a very significant issue that's getting a lot of policy attention um, and just a lot of attention in, in general. And I think that's, um, that's a tough nut to crack. There's a lot of good efforts going on um, in, that, in that area, but figuring out how to measure quality effectively and then communicate it, I think is, is probably the biggest challenge and opportunity ahead of us. Okay, Jonathan? Uh, biggest opportunity? Uh, biggest trend, biggest trend. Biggest trend. Yeah, 
So I think Jim, Michelle, I think the biggest trend for, for me is actually um, that you see from the ed traditional education side of the world, you've got uh, higher education trying to focus more on employment worthiness, and you've got employers focusing on credential worthiness, two areas that they're both kind of relatively new at, as a ge generally speaking, and seeing those two come together uh, really blurs the boundaries in a way that I think will serve the, the, the lifelong learner in a very, a very meaningful way. Great. And are there any other things that we should be looking out for uh, going forward, uh, again, from each of your perspectives? You know, the future is hard to tell, but I know you guys have uh, have the, the pulse of the industry. So, Michelle, do you any other points about uh, what we can expect to see in, in this area? Well, I do think one interesting trend as well is, um, you know, the, the combination of different kinds of credentials. So we've talked, you know, I talked about a whole variety of credentials, but it's not that it's one or the other. And I think in some ways, a lot of power that we, we've seen through the research comes in combinations of, of credentials. So, you know, maybe it's it's something that gives that liberal arts bachelor's degree or associate degree a lot more value is the combination with an industry certification or a badge that really helps to mark someone's skills. And so I think, you know, efforts to think about, you know, combinations, it's not just that you only need one kind, that it's actually thinking about how they can work together in a complementary way. Jonathan? Uh, that was well well said, Michelle. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm kind of imagining a, uh, a, a future which used to seem far off, but seems a lot closer now, uh, where the concept of human capital is not a very abstract word just used by HR professionals or by analysts and business people. Um, to me, what's starting to happen is Human is being put into human capital. It's becoming very personal. It's becoming, uh, we're in a world in which people now are expecting to own the evidence of their own achievements, to tell their own story in a trusted way, um, to be able to have conversation starters with people who are in a position to help them advance their, their professional goals. Um, as you talked about earlier with, with both of us, seeing more human skills represented in this world than, than we've typically uh, seen before. And capital, uh, I think about your skills as, as a form of currency. Your employer today pays you a paycheck, you might get benefits. You know, we, we live in a world in which you get your paycheck from your employer and you have a range of benefits. The number one benefit for most people joining companies today, as we've talked about, is, is, is it going to be a place where I feel like I'm becoming future-proof, where I'm not going into some corner where my skills are going to be quickly out of date? Um, and unlike the paycheck, where you can spend that dollar once, your human capital, you can spend over and over again. And um, I think I think we're seeing that recognition that credentials are just not a, a jargony term. They're not just about a single moment in time. It's about accruing capital that increases your ability to have the kind of mobility that you know that each person's looking for in the world. This has been great conversation. Thank you both for, for doing this. Um, we usually end with a, a poem or a saying. So uh, I'll ask Jonathan if you have any uh, anything to, to share with us as we close this out. Uh, well, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll share with you one of my favorite poems from uh, Billy Collins, um, former poet laureate. Uh, it's called, I Go Back to the House for a Book. I turn around on the gravel and go back to the house for a book something to read at the doctor's office. And while I'm inside running the finger of inquisition along a shelf, another me that did not bother to go back to the house for a book heads out on his own, rolls down the driveway and swings left towards town, a ghost in his ghost car, another knot in the string of time, a good three minutes ahead of me, a spacing that will now continue for the rest of my life. Sometimes I think I see him, a few people in front of me on a line or getting up from a table to leave the restaurant just before I do, slipping into his coat on the way out the door. But there is no catching him, no way to slow him down uh, and put us back in sync, unless one day he decides to go back to the house for something. But I cannot imagine for the life of me what that might be. He is out there, always before me, blazing my trail, invisible scout, hound that pulls me along, Shade I am doomed to follow, my perfect double, only bumped an inch into the future, 
and not nearly as well-versed as I in the love poems of Ovid, I who went back to the house that fateful winter morning and got the book. Yay, that was great. Uh, Michelle, do you have anything? Were you able to come up with anything? Well, I will say, I, I guess I didn't do my homework well because I, I don't, but I do have a book. So I can tell you the full title of our book. So um, the credential book I mentioned before, there's actually a longer title, it's called Credentials. Understand the problems, identify the opportunities, create the solutions. And my co-author is Paul Gaston, and this is the book. So I guess if you wanna go back to the house and get the book, you can get this book. Um, that's what I got today. <laughs> that's perfect. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you both of you for doing this. This is, uh, this is really informative and, and interesting. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please like it, leave a review, and subscribe. See you soon.